Dell session. So it's about what Jeffrey was talking about in a session on Monday, but also in the evening on Sunday for the people that were there. Was anybody not there? Okay. Uh, I think you're gonna like this. What I'm not covering in detail is uh, the nano server philosophy, but I'll mention it. So, bad news. That's my PowerPoint. Woohoo! Uh, I always try to make it fun and interactive. So if you have any questions, shout out and don't bite hard. So. What we will cover? When, well, a little bit of history 101. Because we kind of need that be for understanding why we want something like Dell. The Cloud OS, Data Center Obsection Layer, Open Management Infrastructure, and DMTF. And a few things afterwards that I couldn't really fit into uh, a generic name. Little pictures, please. I'm sorry. So, the hardware abstraction layer. It's a little thing introduced in Windows XP. Basically, plug and play. The idea behind it was uh, something to have an abstraction layer over the hardware. So, a piece of software in between, and your software, your uh, printer driver, if you will, talks to that, and that piece of software talks to the printer, or the printer um, connected through USB. The power of this was that suddenly it became easy to program to, to a type of device. Because a network card always has a MAC address. A storage device always has a LAN. It has a storage array, etc. So if you take those generic components, you can standardize that. This is not a Microsoft thing, by the way. Microsoft used it. Microsoft was included in the uh, talks and the design of it. But it was also Cisco and Dell, HP. I believe even Linux, but don't pin me on that one. So, there's one thing in here that I found actually very funny. X86 servers? No 64 bits? Well, of course there is. <coughs> but this is the official text from uh, I found on the internet, and I was like, <laughs> they've not updated this. So the Cloud OS is basically a traditional operating system, um, scoped to the cloud, and it's scalable. That's the whole idea. When you talk, uh, talk about nano server, nano server is just an operating system with only the things an operating system needs, nothing more. If you want to add functionality to it, you install a Windows feature like you would install a Windows uh, a, a package, for example, on a Windows server. So all the binaries are not included. A clean OS. Efficient. And I don't know if you've seen a, a nano server session, but the deployment time was cut no, not even in half, like 20 times. Because all the binaries for clustering are not needed for web server. A little problem. There was DCOM and WMI. Not very firewall friendly. Especially DECOM. Uh, yeah, that was an issue for management. So the solutions were WSMAN and SIM. I'll come back to that. So the data center abstraction layer, um, to make that possible, there were introduced a few commandlets. The verb PSC, PCSV in the noun uh, commandlets. The point is um, out-of-band management, and if you've ever used System Center Configuration Manager, 
or SCCM or Conflict Manager, what's the its name these days? SCCM. Is it back to SCCM? Uh, yeah, yeah, Conflict Manager. <laughs> okay. <coughs> that product. Uh, it has uh, out of band management uh, yeah, functionality, which I mainly use for uh, routers and Linux devices. But it is extremely limited. And the, these commandlets uh, offer quite a bit more functionality. Back when Design State Configuration was introduced for Linux, um, at least when the MVPs were shown it, uh, Jeffrey was like, well, you can do it, uh, something we asked, but there is no commandlet for it. There's no DC resource yet for it. On the other hand, Linux has the SIM in it. So what you can do is use SIM and PowerShell normal syntax to connect to your Linux device and configure it. If there's not a resource yet, SIM can probably do it somehow, some way. So this is the whole point. Either if you have Windows, Linux or something else, by the way, no Apple. Apple was like, no. Okay, no Apple. Okay. Does anybody have an Apple data center product? <laughs> it's asking. There actually is uh, an Apple server thingy. Um, does, it, does it still exist? No. Uh, no? I actually know a company that's still using it, so... Anyway, uh, whether you have Windows or not, other operating system, uh, the data center abstraction layer is... Uh, the abstraction layer over the physical hardware. And it allows some a unified way to configure stuff. Because if you talk to a, a network card, you call a, a MAC address. It's called MAC address on Windows, but also on Linux. And I'll get back to that why that's the case. Somebody actually thought of this and was like, hey, let's do this in this and this and this way. And that's a little thing they call architecture. And somehow that's Jeffrey's thing as a lead architect. Yeah. So, no Dell. That's the past. Each vendor had their own management solution and standard. And every now and then a vendor comes out with a standard, a second, third, fourth, fifth vendor comes out with a standard, and most of the times, eventually, one, <coughs> maybe two, actually uh, lift off and they become the standard. Take, for example, Blu-ray. You had Blu-ray and you had, what else? HTVG. Correct. So, why did Blu-ray become the most uh, dominant flavor? Any takers? People didn't like the red color. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, basically, it's very simple. The movie industry embraced it. And the moment they did, it became standard. So, information is not interchangeable through uh, m many systems if they have their own standards. Because then you have to write something like a translator, like, hey, over, this, over here it's called A, over here it's called B. But basically it's the same thing. So let's call it C. You still follow it? I don't. Because that's just two vendors. What if you have 20? That's a lot of fun. Um, the data center abstraction layer has very uh, much, uh, has a lot of uh, components in there. Uh, it's uh, more concepts, etc. Three of them I want to mention. The system management architecture for server hardware. And basically, because I like the word, the, uh, the acronym, Hulk Smash. But for data center, 
if you standardize your server hardware, you can have a unified way of talking to it from Linux as an operating system or Windows as an operating system. The common information model, SIM. Who does not know it? No fingers. Okay. Did you know that in a way WMI is SIM? So what Microsoft did back in the day was, hey, we need something like SIM. But this SIM thing, that doesn't uh, really comply with our needs. SIM was very young these days, uh, those days. So what Microsoft did was take the SIM server uh, yeah, idea, implement it in Windows, build on top of that, expand it, and they called it Windows Management Infrastructure. WMI. But now, WMI, not firewall friendly, etc., etc. And it's also not an open standard. SIM is. So what happened next? Other vendors were, uh, were including SIM in the product. Not WMI. And SIM has evolved over the last decade. It has evolved quite a lot actually. So Microsoft again visited the SIM model and they were like, hey, this is really good stuff. Let's use this instead. And I don't know exactly which Windows version, but uh, there was a SIM V2 namespace included in Windows. And that's when they already were going in the SIM direction. Just imagine how long this took. And the storage management initiative. This was one of the first uh, open standards from the DMTF uh, Foundation. Um, I'll get back to you on that. You have to uh, keep in mind that SIM is the center of just about anything that came out of DMTF. I have a graph uh, about that in a few. So the goal of Dell is unified management and to pro provide an abstraction layer like so. Jeffrey, in a way, already uh, has drawn this uh, on Sunday evening. <coughs> so OMI, DMTF, there we go. So I don't know what DMTF stands for. I always uh, Google it or Bing, never Bing, but uh, mm -hmm. I Google it. Um, it's what? Desktop management task force. I trust you. <laughs> Desktop management task force. Okay. Do document management. Task document. Force. No, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll get back to it, <laughs> probably. Uh, it has a small system support, and I'll show you some st statistics why this is the case. It is pretty easy to implement. And it does a few other advantages. By the way, optional PowerShell support. Woohoo! We can do stuff with it. It's extensible. So, desired state configuration is a framework. It's extensible. PowerShell, with its modules, is extensible. Even PowerShell ISE, guess what? ISE steroids. It's extensible. And that's the thing for the voucher product team. Create something where the community <coughs> can build on top of if they want to. Uh, a few bunch of other statistics. Three of them I found actually rather interesting. The server object is less than 250 KB for, for OMI, on embedded uh, mobile systems. 250K. That's nothing! Seriously, I have Word documents that are bigger. Less than one megabyte of RAM is needed for OMI. That's awesome. Uh, 
that's something I found interesting because uh, I know that Cisco has been doing things like this for ever, I believe, but it's a diskless operation. Everything is done in RAM. It's freaking fast, by the way. Because it needs to be. It is, uh, OMI, it is what's in between anything. It has so much it needs to calculate, redirect, etc. It needs speed. Oh, by the way, concrete provider classes <coughs> use less code. Less code is always a, a kind of, uh, for me, an upside. But it also um, offers classes, not PowerShell classes, but uh, entirely in C, so C classes with inheritance and reusable code comes into play here. What you, know, you can say is, hey, I want to build on top of w, uh, OMI, and OMI has a class in there, a base class. So my class kind of does the same thing, but differs just a little bit. So what you can say is, hey, I've got my class, and it is based on top of that class. So I get all the flavors and the magic from that class, and I only need to define how I differ from that one. Let's code. So, security. <coughs> it sounds like they actually thought of this. And I say it's surprising, but yeah, not so much. It's pretty useful these days, security. Because who has ever been attacked by a hacker? Seriously, no fingers? Are you that ignorant? <laughs> you just don't want to admit it. <laughs> Probably. So again, 250 KB footprint, one megabyte of working set of RAM. So all of this is in RAM. 250 KB, it's loaded into RAM, that's OMI. And it only needs one megabyte to do its magic. And DMTF in the open group. Uh, those are the initiators of the OMI project, initially. DMTF, you have to understand, it's a foundation where a lot of companies are included in, represented in. Intel has somebody in there. Microsoft has or had, I don't know anymore, but somebody in there. HP, <coughs> yep. So a lot of companies that basically form the foundation of the IT industry, from a uh, data center uh, perspective, they are included in this. They have a say in this and steer this. They define the standards. And the beauty, they define the standards in collaboration with each other. So a standard really becomes a standard and not their own standard, like 20 flavors. So this is something I was asked by Lennon's guy. Why use OMI? Why not, why not just open Pegasus? Well, a few statistics. That's pretty neat. OMI is a heck of a lot small, smaller. And uh, looking at speed, I don't know exactly uh, compare, uh, statistics <coughs> about that. But so far, OMI does its job pretty good. So. DMTF, and now we get back to SIM. It's uh, surrounded in yellow. SIM is the base for almost anything that came out of DMTF. If they have something like, hey, WBM, protocols and minings. That's nice, we need something else. So they add something, then they add another uh, component and they expand the SIM schema and the SIM infrastructure. That's a little thing called architecture.
So what's the goal? Any takers on this? Nobody? Hell freezes over. Microsoft is supporting this. Why? Because they included SIM and OMI. So, 10 years ago, or even when PowerShell V1 came out, would you have ever thought that you could use PowerShell to manage Linux? Seriously? No fingers? No, I didn't at all. So, little statistic. You know why Microsoft really likes you running uh, Linux on Azure? <laughs> they make 8 to 10 times more money you running Linux on Azure than Windows on Azure. Yeah, money. It's all about the money. So, just in case you didn't know, I'm Jeff Wouters. I was almost thought I got my five minutes uh, time. <laughs> Whoa, I'm quick. Well, hi Dan. Uh, my Dan. <laughs> so I found the Dutch Power Use Group. And this is how you can contact me. Are there any questions? Because I went very fast. <laughs> so is there anything you kind of want to know about a certain vendor that is not included in DMTF or Apple? If it's Apple you want to know about, I don't know Apple. I don't do Apple, ever. So. I can't really figure out where the OMI uh, relating to, to SIM, what, what, how does it differ? What, what can it actually do with OMI? I've never talked to OMI, I always do. So OMI is basically all of this. It wraps everything. Yeah, so now it's a common name for all of these standards. And SIM is just one tiny, not, not tiny, but one uh, component of the OMI uh, framework. Um, but looking from PowerShell, that's the one we talked to. Yeah, I, I don't find the uh, OMI commands. Uh, uh, you will not find them. Um, are there any other questions? You mentioned OMI was sort of RAM based. What's the story around sort of persistence? Like, is there data that is to be persisted? <coughs> and you've got sort of different providers in there. Yeah. So, what is that OMI actually persisting? Um. Because I'm presuming each provider has its own storage to allow you to use different management tools to access those providers. Correct. The idea is that uh, I think we are going a little bit in a mix up between OMI and Dell. Because, like I said, OMI is just uh, uh, these standards. Mm -hmm. um, and the data center abstraction layer uses the OMI standards, among them SIM, heavily uh, to talk to uh, hardware components in the same way. So, does that, does that answer your question? So, so you're saying OMI is like a common way of accessing different providers? No, SIM is. Okay. You lost me a bit there, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's, that's why I always ask, are there any questions? Um, let's take, for example, SMI, uh, SMIS, storage. If you have a NetApp or Equalogic, uh, then you can use SIM to talk to that in a unified way. Yeah. So what, what's, the, what's OMI's participation in that? Uh, you say it's got a footprint on, on machines or what? Yeah. So OMI is, in this case, among them is uh, the SIM server. 
Um, yeah, that's a little bit uh, tricky. Sim server isn't really like a physical server. It is just a component that's running on the operating system and they call it server. Um, and that's one of the things that's stored in the OMI stuff in RAM. But, but SIM is not included in the specs you, you posted there, right? Where there? Uh, the 8 kilobyte of RAM and blah blah blah, stuff like that. That's, that, that doesn't include the SIM server, does it? Uh, to my knowledge, sure it does. If you go, if you go one slide forward, the one you had before, this one, if yeah. you just replace DMTF here with OMI, that's about it, right? No, so no, no, no. All this is OMI, falls no. under OMI. No, no, no. All these standards, no? Um, not all of them, most of them. Most of them, okay. Uh, for example, WBAN is included. As in BIOS, you know for sure. Um, not all of them, but many. Most, I would say, um, and only when they are ap applicable to, like, any vendor uh, that's participating in DMTF. That's in, yeah, that's yeah. There are a few other things wh where they um, define a standard um, that is not applicable to all of them. I don't know an example right now out of my head, and I, yeah, I ca would kind of like that. Um, but sometimes they, they look at the industry and they see, hey, this will become important, so we need to find a standard for this, we need to think about it. They either include that vendor into the MTF, or they talk amongst each other, hey, are any of us doing something like this? If the case is yes, then they collaborate and define the standard. Um, and most of the times there is still at least some input from the vendor that triggered this. Even if they're not included in the MTF, they will, they will really take a look at their product and, hey, how are you doing this? What are you naming? How, what's your structure? What, how do you set this up? Uh, well in, as far as I know, in general, first uh, the idea comes in from a vendor then they define the standard, and then they implement it. Because else you need to basically implement it, define the standard, redo your work again, and who loves to do rework? Really? <laughs> yeah. So, this is quite a bit of theory, and no PowerShell code. So why? Would you think I would ever include this session in a PowerShell conference? Well, I said it before. Who would have thought that you could manage Linux with PowerShell? Yeah. And looking at this, uh, specifically this one. Data center abstraction layer. What kind of data centers do you have? On premise data center, your data center, private cloud. But Azure is also a data center, multiple action. So Azure public cloud is also one. Let's take a look. If this can be either local or public. And the hardware can either be in your data center or a data center you don't care about. Uh, depending on your legal challenges. So from a Windows perspective, in a few, uh, I hope, months, um, sometime, you will be able to use uh, PowerShell commandlets to talk to data center for now Microsoft Data Center, but basically where it's located, you don't need to know, you don't need to care about it, just talk to it. 
in the same way. No, that's kind of the important thing. Um, and in the past, uh, there were Azure commandlets, there were System Center commandlets. Uh, uh, sometimes it was called uh, snapshot. Sometimes it was called checkpoint. Uh, there were inconsistencies all over. Why? It was written by many different product teams. Because System Center, how many products is it these days? Done? Any count on that? Nine, ten, eleven? Uh, less. Six. Ah, even even six. That's six teams plus the Azure team. So it's at least seven different teams writing commandlets. And the idea right now is to have uh, the Azure commandlets, but also the Azure stack commandlets. Those are written by the same uh, team that hey, says, hey, we have got some documentation on this. Uh, these are the APIs we can call, we can use, and this is the output we get. So if you make sure that the APIs on your Azure are the same as the APIs on your Azure stack, hey, guess what? You can talk to it the same way. A data center abstraction. And the main goal would be to have, like here, storage. What kind of storage do you have in Azure? Do you know? Are they running NetApps, Equalogics, some custom stuff? I don't know. To my knowledge, they're actually not even telling it anybody. <laughs> but what do you have in your own data center? A one consistent brand of storage? The most customers I have? Nah, not so much. So if you could use the same tooling, or commandlets in a view, to manage it. A LAN is a LAN. A LAN can be created the same way of <coughs> any storage device you have. Storage array configuring the thing. The basics you can configure uh, in a generic way throughout your uh, hardware vendors. Specific stuff, especially NetApp has like a lot of features. Uh, yeah, I can imagine that that would need something like a, a, a plugin or an extensible just specific for NetApp. But the basics still apply. And I explained it one time to the storage people, like, hey, let's see, you in your data center, one of your storage ar uh, arrays fails. That's the worst case scenario. An entire storage device fails. You roll it out, roll a new one in, but hey, wait a sec. You're not doing HP storage, but you're doing uh, uh, NetApp. You roll that one in, HP out, NetApp in. And the system automatically sees, hey, this one left. This one came in. Auto configure the thing through your template. Done. It's up and running. That would be awesome. <coughs> and guess what? That's how Azure is doing it. On mass, by the way. But VMware has it. What? VMware has it. Has this too? Storage IPs. Okay, cool. I don't know if they are also included in the MTF, but looking at the size or and the importance of VMware in the industry, yeah, I could guess so. They also do stuff with data center, I believe. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm a Microsoft guy. <coughs> so, any takers on how long Microsoft has been working toward this goal? Years. Any takers? So I only have an estimate, I don't know for sure. There's a guy in a red shirt that joined the company at some point. The what? There's a guy in the red shirt that joined the company at some point. <laughs> Jeff Jeffrey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I think before him even. So, when the SIN V2 namespace was included in Windows XP, I believe, for the first time, um, that was the first results we saw. 
But remember, Microsoft back then was uh, not as fast as including stuff in their product as these days. So think about two or three years before that. So XP came out in 2000 and any take us from that one? 12 years now. Something like 12 years. Yeah, 12, 15 years maybe. That takes quite a long time. Especially when you have release cycles of three years. So remember that all of this, this data center abstraction layer and the components for Windows, System Center, etc., etc., et are extensible. It seems to be a trend with Microsoft, extensible stuff. So all they need to do is, hey, we've got a System Center, we've got a new product, new functionality. What do you do? Extend the data center abstraction layer and talk to it. So, I draw, I've drawn it here as one big blue box. Yeah, not so much. Of course, the data center abstraction layer itself is one big blue box. But it consists out of many tiny, tiny little block, uh, boxes. Each with their own goal. That's maintainable. That's maintainable by many different product teams. Because could you imagine that uh, Azure Azure as a whole, including the new features, the maintaining the stuff, fixing boxes, etc. Could you imagine that it was uh, done by one single product team? I couldn't. That thing is huge. So break it up in manageable pieces. Make sure you keep your standards and stick to them, whatever you do. Um, and then you're consistent. And you can automate consistency. So now, since I've already still got a little bit of time, um, is there anybody of you that uh, works at a system integrator, that has customers, etc.? Well, quite a few. Um, a lot of my customers um, we're introduced into System Center. Great! Amazing! <coughs> they haven't even standardized their laptop, desktop or server farms yet. I even had one customer, Config Manager. He had 53 different types of laptops and desktops. And guess what? He had 53 deployments. Every type has its own deployment. It was a manage manageability nightmare. So they hired me to, hey, did this, this manageability thing, can you script it? I'm like, I probably could, but what the hell are you doing here? So driver packs were uh, introduced and they were like, whoa, this is awesome. Um, they were running hardware of five years old, easy. That, thank God, that was the laptops and desktops, by the way, not the server. So, that's the thing. Start with standardization. After that comes automation. After that one, self-service. So, who has customers that does this in a different order? I do. <laughs> so. Any ideas on how you could help a customer yeah, do this in a manageable way? Like customers uh, implementing uh, system center orchestrators, self-service, it's great. We can offer our uh, users in their own functionality. Uh, they can do it themselves, uh, less work for the help desk, etc. But yeah, then comes along uh, Usernames are inconsistent. Group names, extremely inconsistent. Um, for the people that don't know it, uh, it's still available. I'm just not maintaining it anymore. Uh, I've written an Active Directory Health Check script. I was at a government agency in the Netherlands, and I believe I taught you which one. Um, 
It's a little, yeah. it's a little government agency that's responsible for fighting off the water. And since half of my country is underwater uh, level, it, it is an important thing. And the AD Health Check uh, discovered that they were running Windows XP on kind of critical server and systems to fighting off the water. And they had Quest Active Directory recovery thingy, which is licensed, licensed based on the amount of objects, remember, objects in your Active Directory. We went from a little over 200,000 objects to 60,000. Just imagine the license cost uh, we saved. And that's a personal experience. Um, after that, first clean up, standardize. Because hey, if you have cleaned up, then you've got less to standardize. That's amazing. And yeah, the rest you know already. So getting back to my last point. Any questions? Nothing. Then I would like to thank you. I hope you kind of enjoyed it. And yeah, if there are any questions you're not willing to ask or you have a complaint even, uh, contact me directly. Uh, I don't bite or bash or whatever.